want to point out that I got three of my five sisters here. So if I'm wrong on anything, I don't want anybody saying anything about it tonight because they think I'm infallible. <laughs> no. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I came over um, this summer, I guess, to that party at, at uh, the bush here somewhere and uh, got talked into this. I didn't know what I had to offer, but uh, somebody else thought it might be worthwhile. So here I am, folks. It's, uh, a lot of my thoughts will be disjointed, but that's the age thing, okay? It's got nothing to do with concentration. I, I was born in Vancouver in 1940. My dad was in the Navy, and uh, he moved over here, and I was smart enough to come with him. And uh, we would lived on Vancouver Street at one time. Of course, he uh, liked to make the odd bet, and when I was young, maybe three or four years old, he'd get home from work. And we'd go over the old Willows racetrack and uh, sit on the fence. And he'd sit me up on the fence and he'd make a, a bet, I guess, and I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I uh, went to Bank Street School. I don't know if that still exists or not. Yeah, yeah. It yeah, does exist. Sure, yeah. Wow, because it was, it was old then. And uh, I guess with the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs in those days, the DVA put out uh, mortgages for veterans and, and uh, armed forces personnel. And using that, we moved to the big old farmhouse right at the foot of the, the Church Hill on West Saanich Road. I was in grade one at the time. And... Uh, had to go to a new school, and of course the other school was also new to me. I think I was a pretty well protected kid because I was perfect. And uh, so I'm this new kid in school, and I think Jack Mather still remembers it. I don't know why, but here's the, here's the city kid come to the country, and it was the country in those days. So I got along there, and I don't know if it was that year or the next year, it was the cutest little girl I had ever seen arrived in school. She was kind of a girly girl. The others were cute. Bonnie Footner was, of course. But she was different. And of course, that was Marilyn Cudmore. And, uh, <laughs> met, her, met her again tonight. She hasn't changed. <laughs> the, uh, the school in those days, of course, was what I call the annex, which I guess is the, is the original school. And then there was a double, double uh, building with the two classrooms in it. We had split classes. And I remember that I was always more interested in what the class ahead of me was doing than what I was doing, and I didn't do much of my own work, but I had fun doing the, the one ahead of me. It didn't do me any good, but uh, there we are. And the rest was kind of a blur. Uh, had lots of fun um, until I got to about grade six. And at that point, they moved us over into the, again, the annex, into the basement classroom. We thought we were pretty good living in there. Mr. Wilway was the president. He's, he had one arm, a leather hand, and uh, of course he was the principal, so the office was in the other building, so he had to spend a lot of time over there. Well, they, uh, there was the one door in the front. Of course, you had to have the two exits, so they put a door in the side, and the, the uh, cement foundation, I remember, was sort of two or three feet up, and then the door out the side. And of course, the school, the building was between there and the, and the office. So he couldn't see us all going out that side door and we were supposed to be sitting there doing our work. The other thing I remember about that is that the back of that classroom was an oil burner to heat the, heat the building. And of course, he would uh, disappear off to the, uh, the office at lunchtime. Of course, we're in grade six, we can be trusted. Well, we turned that oil burner up so far, we could actually toast our sandwiches on it. <laughs> Why we didn't burn the place down, of course, oiled floors in those days and everything, and no linoleum, it was all just oiled old floors, but uh, obviously it didn't burn down, I guess, because we were so smart. The uh, sports field was up behind that, about the length of a soccer field, and it had a huge, giant fence on the one side of it with the wire on there, and of course it was a great sport, sport to kick the soccer ball over. And then we had to make the round trip to go catch it. The uh, school area at that time was the, uh, the municipal hall. I don't know if it's still there or not. The police department was in the people. Uh, thanks. This uh, police department was in the bottom, 
Of course, I knew most of them friendly, not that they were after me until later. Um, then there was the Women's Institute Hall next to that, and that place I hated. Because <laughs> that's where they had the dance classes. And my mother thought that I should learn to dance and I should learn to square dance and everything else. And I thought it much more important that I learned to throw a, a curve playing baseball. So I managed to put up with that. And then there was the, uh, the store next door to it. My sister tells me it was Stinson's store. It had apartments above that, I think. And um, the, there was a house right behind it in a, on a lot. And a guy by the name of Don Ward, who would have been two or three years older than me, and his sister, and I don't remember her name. I don't remember my own name half the time. But they lived there, and eventually I got... He had the paper route, the morning paper route, and eventually I got that uh, when he outgrew it. Now, in those days, Mount Newton, of course, was the, the ogre that uh, all the little kids were threatened with, that that's where we were going to have to go. We are going to have to take a bus and meet all those rough kids from up that area and everything else. And the first year they opened the Royal Oak Junior Senior High School, and um, I recall the elementary school right beside it. So I didn't have to go to Mount Newton. It was a kind of an L-shaped building that had a, a real nice gym and on the top they had the, uh, the shop with Mr. Bennell. And uh, I never knew him at all, but he got the biggest cheer of any teacher when they opened the school. And later I could see why he was just a great guy. He didn't act like a teacher at all. Um, Right, there was the whole ec class up there too. Uh, I remember a teacher there, Miss Horrell, I think her name was. And I ran into her later. I was working in the shipyards. Her husband uh, worked with me, and I thought, that's odd. There's a teacher sort of in my, my same age group. And the other one was the typing class. And uh, the star of the class here, of course, is Mr. Sheldrake. <laughs> because he's got a pin, the Order of Canada, that he can wear for his typing skills. And of all my years in school, that's the one thing I regret that I never paid attention in was the typing class because, of course, now it's all, all typing. Um, yeah, my one finger's got callus. There was a nice gym in that school. Uh, which was a which was a, a change, and of course the the uh, gym instructor was Larry Booth, who uh, played for the Shamrocks, and of course I've been a, a lacrosse fan, played lacrosse myself, and he was a bit of a hero until I met him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was a tough guy. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thing that sticks in my mind about him, that we were down in, I can't remember what kind of a class it was, but it was grade 9 or 10, I guess. And Harvey Sherman, I guess, who is not here tonight, yeah. it's a good thing because I owe him a pop right in the nose, <laughs> was throwing spitballs at him from the back towards the front. And uh, Larry Booth walked in, and I guess I'm Mr. Innocent sitting there, and all of a sudden the briefcase whapped me in the ribs and said, get up to the principal's office. I said, okay. So it came the strap, and uh, he started on me. And of course, I'd been working, so he didn't hurt much. He tried. And eventually, he was started from back over here somewhere and coming right over the top. And uh, next hand, I just kept sticking him out as long as he wanted to swing. And he was getting madder and madder, and I was sort of giggling. And finally, the principal, Mr. Clark, stepped in and said, I think that's enough. And that was. Uh, that was my recollection from the from the high school. <laughs> it's one that kind of sticks with it. <laughs> and of course, when we first moved out to West Saanich and Markham Road there, the uh, Markham Road uh, went down it today with Heather, and uh, it's like Grand Central Station. I couldn't believe it. It was almost a can it was a, a trail down that road, and it was almost covered with uh, hawthorn trees. Mm -hmm. Is that the right term? Mm -hmm. And it was like a tunnel down there, and of course that was a great beyond to a kid, you know, six years old who didn't know what was down there, except that the kids from the end walked out every morning with a little trailer, and they had milk cans on it, and they would leave it on the corner of Markham Road, and the West Sandwich freight truck would pick it up and deliver it to the dairy, I guess, and then leave empty ones, and they'd pick them up when they went home at night. A couple of deer occasionally walked down Markham Road, and that was 
kind of worth a comment in those days. Now they're just, I guess, overrun with deer. But it, it was a pretty big deal in those days because you could shoot them. Um, and across the road, fronting West, uh, West Saanich, across Markham and, and fronting West Saanich, um, there was a great big old barn. And it was one of those spooky places that six-year-old kids didn't want, seven-year-old kids didn't want to go to. I don't know who owned it. I don't know when it came down, but it just sort of vanished in, in my memory. Um, somebody probably knows who owned it here, but I see. I just asked Arnold, and it was Dick Devern. <laughs> okay. Um, and on our property, out behind the house, was a great big old barn. And of course, when you're six years old, everything's great and big. But it uh, had big sliding doors in the front and a, a one door that opened. It had a big hayloft in it with the arm out over it with a pulley system where the, the fork would drop down and, and pick up loose hay with its tongs, lift it up, pull it back, and you'd, you'd trip it in. Bales weren't common in those days. It was a great place to play. And uh, early on, I don't know, six or seven years old, mother sent me out to the barn when I don't know why to this day. But I thought I was a pretty tough guy, so I opened the door, screamed and slammed the door and ran for my mother. And of course, it was a whole bunch of horses standing and looking me in the face. We didn't own any horses, <laughs> which kind of was scary. Uh, next door to us on the, to the east side, I guess, was uh, the Hawks family, Ted Hawks and Flo, Florence Hawks, I think. He owned Hawks Realty in Vancouver, and he was quite a horseman. He had... Uh, he had some pretty quality horses. He had a, a jumper named Gamelon. And this horse was at least the best in British Columbia. And I think further than that, I, I sort of in the back of my mind, I remember the Toronto Horse Show, which was is as, as good as you get in the, in the show horse thing. But he also had a little pony that had lived in the circus. And this pony could get out of anywhere. He could open gates, he could untie knots. He was just Houdini with, it, with the horse world. And obviously he was the leader of the herd. And um, come on pals, let's go for a walk. I'll open the gate and let's go to McDonald's and scare the crap out of that little kid. <laughs> so we, uh, mother of course didn't believe, you know, it was horses in the barn, so she didn't believe. But anyway, she phoned Hawks and Ted came and got them. And. Uh, I used to sit and watch them across the field, make sure they were still there. <laughs> and of course, in those days, we walked or biked to school, uh, which you could do, but I don't know if you can do that now. But uh, on the way home, of course, Colquitt's Creek ran under the road, and that was a water, and kids, it was a great source of entertainment on the way home. Um, and just east of the creek, on the north side of West Saanich, there was an old a horse trough, cement horse trough, and uh, for the early days, I guess. I don't remember, I think, Grant, you probably know it worked. I don't know how they filled it or anything else. but it, Maybe it, for, uh, by gravity from the creek, I think. Is that what it was? I think. But uh, I know it did work, and the odd kid got dunked in there on the way home. Um, and, of course, Ken Kiernan, uh, who was the agriculture minister at, later on in Bennett's government lived in the house there with his family. And on the way home, um, walking towards home from the uh, school, there was a few people that I remember. There was Mrs. Mellish, who was the piano teacher. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking Heather Bell Kennels. Is that, is that right? Okay. God, I'm good. And she uh, raised mastiffs. And uh, I still can't play the piano because I'm sitting there petrified looking at this big <laughs> mastiff over my shoulder. I could find middle C and that was it, folks. I didn't really want to be near that, be near that, be near that dog. And there was Mrs. Hobbs who lived up on the corner by Wilkinson Road, uh, who was a nice little old English lady. I remember she was kind of an artist. A lady over here shaking her head, God, I don't know why I'm up here. <laughs> she should be. Um, and uh, we would cut her, you know, she would pay the kids to cut her lawn and that sort of thing. She was kind of an elderly woman. And um, 
going down the uh, the store, of course, on the corner of Wilkinson and West Saanich, and I can't remember the couple that owned that. Uh, orchard. Orchards, that's what it was. <laughs> Sisters know everything. They, uh, that was my first job. I got a job in there stacking the shelves and carrying stuff out and delivering stuff for, for people close. And of course, there's no credit cards in those days, and they would extend credit. Um, and people would come in, and I guess payday, they would come in and pay their bill, and, and things worked well. Um, down at the foot of that hill on the west side of um, Colquitt's Creek, on the north side of the street road, was a guy, and I think maybe Mr. Cudell, or, or something very close to that. And the only reason I remember this guy is that he wanted us to help pick fruit, and he had currants, which had got to be the fiddliest, stupidest thing you've ever tried to pick in your life. I mean, there's an expression that I won't use here. And there was uh, carrying on the Zazulis, uh, uh, Pete was the bodybuilder, he was a big, strong kid. And his sister was Sonia. She would be a year, I think, older than I was. Um, and then the corner of Cheeseman, um, there was Wendy Williams on the corner. She was a year or two older than me, and the brother Wayne. Um, I always remember her. She was a runner. God, could she run? She just not the stand-up straight thing they do now, but she was fast. Uh, high school, so she was uh, quite a star. And of course, Goyette slid up at the top. Now also on that walk home, which got pretty entertaining sometimes, um, one of the activities that kids, never me of course, would carry on was throwing stones, uh, often at each other from a distance, um, and usually at the glass insulators on the, on the power, on the telephone pole. So if your telephone went out, the guy at the end here obviously knows that. <laughs> And there was a guy, uh, Walt Mycock was the, one of the Saanich police officers. I knew his friend, his son Dave, and a couple <clears> of years <throat> younger than him, and I can't remember this kid's name. Um, yeah. Sorry? Walter yes. Mycock? Walter Mycock. Yes. But, uh, there was Dave was his, my pal, and then a couple of years younger than him was his. Dennis. Dennis, was it? Mm -hmm. He was a pound of paper first when he went to the police department. He, uh, he was classic. He could pick those insulators off. Just one after the other. He, he was good. And the funny thing is, later on in life, I'm coaching my son in Little League Baseball, and I'd get kids 10, 11 years old, and they would be throwing the ball like this, and they had no idea. So I tried to throw them, and finally one day in, in exasperation, I said, haven't you guys ever thrown a rock? Well, you'd think I was a devil risen up. And they all looked at me and said, what? So I talked to them, and their mothers would have killed them if they'd thrown rocks. <laughs> Most of them couldn't even throw a rock into the water at the ocean. I mean, that's, that's how bad it was. It was just bizarre. The, um, the Culcrits Creek, of course, uh, right on the south side of the road, there was a nice little pond there. And there was a tree that I remember is, is probably a maple tree, and it had a, on the west side of the bank, and it had a big outgrowth probably a big, big large burl um, hanging out and it made a beautiful little pond for the fish to hide in underneath. So we'd lie down on there and great fishermen hunters would drop our worms in, in front of these fish and you'd catch the odd one in there. And I remember doing that one day, and it was a weekend I think, his dad was home and all of a sudden my rod, my gear, and everything, there was a splash in this thing, and off it went down the creek, just going like hell. So I chased it, got my rod back, lost the gear, lost the fish and everything else, and the, the only thing I can think to this day, it was a steelhead. And how it got up in there, I don't think we ever saw a steelhead in there before or again. Uh, but I can say I caught it, but uh, not, for not for long, but I caught it. <laughs> The, um, the only, it was a great place to grow up in Royal Oak. Um, there was lots of bush, there was lots of fields to play in, lots of, you could roam and, and uh, do whatever you wanted pretty much. The only downside, of course, was no sports organizations like 
baseball or lacrosse or, or anything. Later I played basketball in, in uh, Cordova Bay and then I played out at Brentwood when I was about 16, I guess. And uh, in those times you would take a trip to Souk for the evening, which was a drive because there's no highways like there is now. And occasionally up to Port Alberni, which uh, Alberni had, I believe, the senior men's uh, basketball championship team in Canada, the Alberni Athletics. And we would, <coughs> excuse me, we would play as uh, before they played. So we'd uh, sit and watch Elmer Spidell and all those guys. And of course, the radio guy that called their, their games in those days is Jim Robson, of course, the, the old voice of the Canucks. I, every once in a while I see him and I say, Elmer Spidell, and he kind of thinks, God, we're getting old. <laughs> um, the bush, of course, uh, right across from our house was the Scout Hall. Um, Sadler, what did we say his name was? Bob Sadler? Slater. It's Bob Slater. Bob Slater. He was a fireman. He was a scoutmaster in there for years. But you could carry on straight through the bush and up through... Um, was owned by the Singh family that uh, had the, the dairy farm at the top of the church hill. Um, that was a lot of their property and you could carry right on through right up to uh, come out on Beaver Lake Road right by Sheldrakes. Uh, the, uh, the Singh family, there was two older boys, there was Billy and, and Kella, and uh, there was two girls, Prado and Banty, if I remember right. Isn't that right, Bonnie? Yes. Okay. And Bishon, of course, he was my age and, and a good friend, and we did a lot together. And uh, I was talking to Heather, and she said the obituary showed that he died October 1st of, of this year. So I guess we're getting there. He, uh, they had a big dairy farm, and I think Bishon lived in Duncan. He had a, a herd of uh, quality cows. It was at the PNE one year, and I asked, and he wasn't around, so I missed him there. We could also go up in above what is now, I think, Royal Oak Avenue up in Broadmoor, Broad, Broadmead, I'm sorry. Um, and of course that was wild country dust because you just didn't get up there very often. Get up there on a weekend, it was lots of fun. Colquitt's Creek was a never-ending source of entertainment with, the, of course, kids and water. That's the way it was. And every year it uh, would overflow and form Quick's Pond. And it would, in a good year, it would actually run uh, through into our place in the corner of our bottom field would be uh, wet and Hawk's place behind or beside us would be wet halfway up. Um, we would hunt ducks there occasionally. And uh, the one year, Quicks decided that there was some, buddy, some money to be made, so they leased out the hunting rights to uh, a shooting club out of Victoria, which didn't make us very happy because we used to go on there and, and shoot from there too, but now it was private so we couldn't do that. It annoyed us, so we would go sit down in the corner of our field and the ducks would come in uh, probably from Sheldrakes or Beaver Lake and come down the valley and um, we got first crack at them. They weren't, uh, we weren't very popular when we were doing that, but uh, that's one of the things I had to live with. But the best part about Quick's Pond, the Quick's Bottom, I think they call it now, um, each year it would freeze. It was cold in there in those days. There was snow. Uh, my sister's birthday, was, uh, actually it still is, I guess, on the 14th of March. And um, we often had ice skating tobogganing parties uh, for her birthday. And of course, the pond would freeze over. We'd skate for hours and end on it. We'd be absolutely frozen, couldn't feel our feet, our hands weren't a whole lot better. And if it snowed, we'd, we'd plow or, you know, scrape a, a hockey rink out or whatever it was. We couldn't skate where the dam, but some of them could. And when it got chewed up, there's how do you flood it? So we'd pump a hole in, a bunch of hole in the ice and uh, jump on it. The water would come up and we'd spread it around and, and you, it would freeze overnight. And of course, you're out there on a weekend and Things you're getting pretty thirsty, pretty hungry, and you might bring a sandwich down, but you never remember to bring any water, so you drink from the pond. <laughs> now, I know one young guy, and I think there's probably others, got the best dose of worms you ever saw. <laughs> and uh, they were so damned itchy, 
I almost drove my dad nuts when he was driving me to the hospital. It's just something I never really want to go through again. The, um, I mentioned Sheldrick's there. Uh, Grant was two years older than me, I think. And uh, of course his dad was an engineer on the uh, boats in the Navy Yard that my dad was the captain on. And so they were good friends. Uh, Fireboat was was a pretty good deal. I would go to work with Dad occasionally and fish off the, the dock for perch, and, and it was such a great day to spend way to spend the day. Um, Grant, I remember you had cougar hounds at one point. Don't know if you ever caught a cougar. Never saw one. No, okay. <laughs> Dogs kept scaring them away. <laughs> but. Uh, Having said that, my brother took the, the uh, paper route from me after I had it, and as you came along Beaver Lake Road, there was just a little hill down to the, what was it, Vienna Urban uh, right away there? Um, VNS. VNS, okay. And there was a little rock bluff on this thing, and uh, Neil came home one morning, he could hardly talk. There'd been a big cat sitting up on there. It's the only one I think we ever saw, or he ever saw, I never saw it. Now, when I was younger, they sent me to the YMCA to learn to swim. And Archie McKinnon, of course, was Mr. YMCA in those days, and uh, his method of teaching is throw you in the deep end. If you made it, you could swim, and if you didn't, fine, but he, he refined, you know, you could all get out, and he refined that. Uh, he was kind of a heroic figure, I guess, in Victoria. He taught thousands of kids to swim. In small world, and once I was in the Vancouver police, uh, my boss was married to his daughter, Heather uh, Ryan, so he moved back to uh, Victoria when Tom retired. The best part about the lake, uh, my mother had a bee in her bonnet, amongst others, that you couldn't go swimming outside until the 24th of May weekend. Or whatever it fell on in those days, and of course, you know how much parents know when you're that old. So I would go up there going fishing, and you'd fish for bass off the rocks at the back of the lake. I'm sure everybody knows. And of course, I uh, would fall in regularly. I remember coming home one day, and my hair, I guess, was soaking wet. It was late for dinner, so I rushed it. Came home, and uh, they said, uh, "Look, how your hair is wet." I said, "Oh, I fell in." Why aren't your clothes wet? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> the, um, the back of that lake wasn't very well policed in those days, and on the Friday, Saturday, and the odd Sunday night, you would find pretty raunchy parties up in the back, lots of beer and, and drinking and carousing. And for some reason, the police never went up there. You didn't go, Bonnie? Okay. I, didn't, I didn't think so. They were a lot older than us. But on the, uh, the next morning, uh, for the enterprising young fellows that got up at dawn and hustled up there, I think probably I beat Sheldrick once in a while. He'd often beat me. Was the beer bottles that were left over? Uh, two cents a piece. That was pretty good money in those days, and plus whatever else they they'd left up there. I remember finding army guys' hats and all kinds of stuff, junk. But uh, that was one of the um, that was one of the highlights. Um, speaking about parents not knowing very much, later later in life I found the demon rum and quite enjoyed it, and I would be out, still living at home, I'd be out at night when I shouldn't have been drinking, and I would stumble in about one or two o'clock, and our house was an old farmhouse. You came up the back stairs, you turned left and went in, it was a pantry, or so, I guess it was a pantry you call a mudroom, then you would turn right to go into the kitchen, and you would walk right into the old sawdust burner stove, and to get to my bedroom upstairs, I had to walk around the stove, on the other side of it, into the dining room, up the, sta up the stairs to bed. Well, my father wasn't a fool, I guess. And when he thought I was out and maybe shouldn't be, and uh, figured I'd probably overdone it, 
he would leave the oven door down. <laughs> of course, I would come stumbling in Bigfoot. I was, thought I was tippy-toe, and then all of a sudden, crash, I'd go over this <laughs> oven door. And that was it. I knew I was getting up at 6.30 the next morning, whether I liked it or not. <clears throat> the uh, Beaver Lake, when I got older, of course, it, jump in the water on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon and, and swim around the lake and across Elk Lake. Uh, Mathers and that from the other end of town would be over at Happy Land uh, on the north end of the lake. So you'd swim over there and talk to your friends and maybe have a hot dog or something and swim back. It was just a great way to spend an afternoon. And of course, a concession stand at, at uh, Beaver Lake was uh, run by Wilf Sadler and his family. And uh, I always remember um, was there pinball machines in there. And of course, it was highly, highly illegal. Uh, but they would actually pay if you won, won games. Now, seem to remember a nickel. Bonnie, you're giggling. Is that? No, well, I was never allowed to go in that year. Now, of course, my dad was uh, a captain on these ships. And uh, Fred was the one of the engineers, uh, George Sandlitz here, his brother Cliff uh, was a chief engineer for my dad for quite a number of his, his uh, trips. And of course, so he's away at sea and uh, got a great big vegetable garden out in the back to look after and uh, animals. Um, and of course, I had to look after the, the vegetable garden uh, with help from some of the younger ones and I hate gardening to this day. And our first cow, that we got was a nice, gentle Jersey cow. She was a sweetheart, and uh, I learned to milk, uh, milk her and uh, did well. And I don't know what happened to her, but she was replaced by a Jersey Guernsey, and she was huge. Um, she turned out to be the cow from hell. <laughs> I hated her, just, just hated her. Um, she had a mind of her own. There wasn't a fence built she couldn't go through. And of course, we all know the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Well, she thought it would be greener maybe a mile up the road as well. Or I recovered her on Interurban Road. I recovered her on Beaver Lake Road and lots of places uh, closer than that. Um, and of course, once you find her, she'd look at you like, oh, okay. So you'd put a rope on her and try and lead her home. Well, she'd come on her own conditions. Well, maybe I'll stop and eat this, and I'm tugging, and, and uh, she wasn't nasty out there, but she just had a mind of her own. And uh, it got to the point where I would be late for school often enough that the teacher would look at me and say, cow? I'd say, yes, <laughs> sit down. I, uh, I thought, well, I can... I can fix this, and of course, I don't know how many of you know, but the way to dry a cow up from her milk is to not milk her dry. So I thought, well, let's do that. So I would get two-thirds of what she would normally give. I'd, I'd uh, leave that in her and uh, put a little water in the milk, so Mom and Dad thought we were getting the same amount of milk. And uh, I got caught at that, too. I got caught at a lot of things. Um, she was in her own field. Um, actually, Dad and I walked, we put up a brand new uh, barbed wire fence on Markham Road. And she was out in the field one day. She took a look at us, stuck her head through, went like that, walked through the fence, and, and that was it. We just couldn't keep her in. But when she wanted to stay in the field and I wanted her to milk, I'd have to call her. She'd look at you with just a great disdain and wouldn't come and wouldn't come. So finally I had to get a tobacco can. I'd go get an inch or two of feed in this tobacco can and I'd come on bossy, come on, come on, come on. And of course she'd take a step and I'd take two steps and she'd take soon, pretty soon we're running and she's catching me, I'd dump it. And she would stop and eat that, knowing that I'm gonna go back to get another can and, and we'd do this about three times and then she'd get in the stall and, and uh, milk her and she was fine. I don't know what happened to her, but I don't think she's up there. <laughs> now, about that same time, uh, Quicks, of course, who owned Quicks Farm, uh, the mother lived in the big house up on the hill. Um, there was two brothers, Buster, who ran the dairy farm, and his brother, Fred, who was, I think, in construction at that time. And I knew them, and, of course, 
a male calf is of no good to them, going to be no good to them at all. So Buster would often give me uh, a male calf when it's born. Now, how do you get it home? So many of the time, I would throw the calf up over my shoulders, hold its feet and front legs, and I got crapped on a few times. But I'd walk up Wilkinson Road down and, and home, and I would raise them uh, for veal and occasionally a little bit longer. They uh, had to feed them, of course, you put your hand in a bucket of formula, and they suck them pretty soon. They learned to drink by themselves. Uh, made a few dollars at it, didn't get rich. Um, as I said, there was Buster who ran the farm. Um, he, now, he had equipment for the farm. He had a tractor, and he had, uh, at that time, a baler, which wasn't very common in those days. And a guy named Roy Jewell, who lived next to Sheldrakes, <coughs> uh, was a, a heavy-duty mechanic at Heaney's, and I guess he cut some kind of a deal where he'd maintain Buster's equipment for him. And in exchange, he would get to use it, and he would run around and cut hay in places like ours would be four acres or five acres or whatever it was, and then he'd bale it, and he, he went all over the neighborhood uh, cutting and, and custom baling. He'd worked at, he worked at Haney's in the, in the afternoon shift and was haying during the day, and I became friendly with him and, and uh, spent a lot of time throwing bales around with him, both his, you know, in, into his place. Now, Roy was also the local blacksmith farrier. Uh, for the, the whole neighborhood. He's very, very good at it. He was not tall, but he used to gallop horses. <coughs> very, very strong. But he had race horses, which kind of intrigued me a little bit. And uh, I would go out with him in the spring. I spent a lot of time around his farm, and I would go out in the spring to Sandown in the morning where they were training the horses to, to run in Vancouver. I guess I was about 15 at that time. And uh, once the horses were ready, we would get on the <coughs> ferry and take them to Vancouver. Um, one of the guys that was a friend of his, and they all were all racetrack kids when they were young, the Willows and that sort of thing, was a guy named Jerry Milburn. I don't know if any of you know him. He was a teacher at North Saanich. And uh, he was a horseman as well as, as doing his school teaching. And um, he took a little kid out there named me. He wasn't very big. Uh, Inky Anderson, Dennis Anderson is actually his name, but we ended up at the racetrack as Inky because he always had, I don't know what his pens did, but they always had ink on his hand. I still see him in San Francisco when I go down there at the racetrack and I call him Inky and everybody looks at me and he just shakes his head. He's, Nobody should remember that far back, I guess. <laughs> so uh, my aunt used to come over this, they come to Sand, the races came to Sandown in those days, and um, my aunt and her husband owned horses. And they took me out with them one afternoon. This is before, I guess, before I went to uh, with Roy. So I looked at the horses. I looked at the racing form. I was absolutely confused. But there was a horse named Wheatlander there. And I thought, oh, he looks like he's pretty good. So I bet my only $2 on this horse to place because I didn't have enough guts to bet him to win. He won. He paid 10 or $12 to place. And that's been my downfall, folks. <laughs> I, I, was, I was hooked. Um, now that made up for the for the time we took Jerry's uh, mare over there. True Justice, she was called, a great big chestnut mare. First opening day, raining like it, mud was like that deep at the track. It was Jerry and his dad and Art Knowles and myself and a couple others, and over we went. And of course, we watched this nice mare win, paid $92, and between of us, we never had 10 cents on her. <laughs> the tears were, were real. But uh, sometime later, I got even with that, Art Knowles and I were, uh, I was actually working at the right, and he, I served an apprenticeship in the dockyard as a shipwright, and I wasn't very good at it. But there was no work here at all, and so I moved to, uh, went to Vancouver looking for work. And there wasn't a whole lot of work there either. But any time I was out of work and needed money, I could go to the racetrack and as, get a groom's job just like that. I was pretty good at it. And uh, I would watch races every day. And I'd, I'd pick out horses that maybe ran into a little bit of trouble in a race. And I thought I might have a chance to win next time. And uh, one night I was standing there with Art Knowles, who was a butcher from Bang, uh, Victoria. And a horse called Flea S, and Inky Anderson was on it. He rode this thing up to the gate at a gallop, 
took it back. Second time I looked at Art, is he watching this? He said, yeah. And they were just about to go into the gate, so we ran for the windows. And all in those days, you get the $2 win, place, or show. You couldn't get them all like today. I ended up with the $2 win window, and I said, start punching tickets. I'd had a pretty good day. And the bell rang, and it stopped. And I don't know how many I had, but the horse paid $55. I had money sticking out of my pockets, out of my ears. <laughs> I, was, I was a big shot that night. Um, I liked the people at the racetrack. I, uh, when I was 16, I stayed over there for a couple of weeks and lived in the tack room on the back and, and thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, and I, it uh, had a lot to do with later in life. The, um, at the top of the church hill, of course, was the church, the Anglican church up there, I think. And uh, we never did, you know, Halloween, we'd try and get into trouble without destroying or hurting anybody. So it came to mind one night, one week, that I thought maybe nobody would ever rung the church bells. So Halloween night, I stuck, snuck up there, and um, all of a sudden the church bells are ringing all out across the valley, and then there's some little guy screaming down the hill as fast as he could run, scared <laughs> stiff. And I gather it was done after that, but um, it was a good thing at the time. But across the, uh, across the road, like next door was the Sings Dairy Farm, and across the road was a, a little yellow house, I remember right, and the local veterinarian lived there, his name was Doc Lehman, L-E-H-M-A-N, I think. He had a son, and I can't remember his, I can't remember my own name, but I can't remember his, but he was the guy you called when your cow had problems or, or whatever else, and uh, I guess he was a pretty good little country vet. But almost right behind him, there was a larger farm was almost hidden from the road by uh, bushes and a guy named Archie Brown owned that. Now he had cows in there but he also had racehorses which were where Roy Jewell and I would show up. And he had a farm hand with him. Um, the guy was obviously mentally challenged is the term they use these days. Um, he was from, I was found out later, the Wilkinson Road mental home at that point. Uh, Archie had him out on kind of a lease, land lease basis and paid him you know, work and he worked, stayed at the farm and, and worked for Archie. He was always smiling. He was either busy rolling a cigarette or he was smoking a cigarette. Or he, he never saw him do anything else. He would sit there and we'd have a conversation and he'd look at you and yeah, yeah, you know, he, he didn't understand much. Um, but the story I heard later was that for some reason uh, he had to go back to Wilkinson Road and that, he was perfectly happy living with Archie, he was harmless, but for some reason he had to go back to Wilkinson, back to the institution, which upset him, and he got a rifle, I understand, out of a piggery uh, on the farm or somewhere, and decided he wasn't going back. Um, so he got down and started shooting. And of course, the Saanich police arrived and, and were looking for him. One of the officers was sneaking through the bush, I guess, and came up on Ramey, his name was Ramey. And he was in sort of a deadfall log area looking out over the valley. And instead of doing something, that policeman went for help. And while he was gone for help, Ramey shot and killed one of the Saanich police officers, a guy by the name of Kirby, who lived up at the, yeah lived up at the corner of Beaver Lake Road and right across from the store. So that's, uh, that was one of the bad days. Uh, also in that area, racehorses again, was getting an art masters. Uh, he had a nice mare called the Lady Pleases. It was, it was a pretty good uh, horse area. Um, as I said earlier, I served an apprenticeship and, and uh, went to Victoria um, or Vancouver. I served for work. And the, uh, when I was out of work, I'd go to the track and, and make money there. And that's about all I've got, folks. I've got, and as I say, it's not a lot of Royal Oak, but as I said to Ann earlier, Christ, I left here half a century ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot worse than 50 years, doesn't it? <laughs>